Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Creston Reeves event that's aimed at supporting COFAs and practice managers. I'm Jennifer Williamson, a partner at Creston Reeves, and I will be chairing our session today. And we're delighted to have you join us. So just a little bit about Creston Reeves before we dive into the presentations. For those of you who don't know us, we're really proud to work alongside our clients to help them achieve their goals, both in the UK and internationally through our Creston network. And if you'll just indulge me in a moment of shameless self-promotion, we have been delighted in recent months to be recognised for the support we give our clients and our people. And, and this is our haul from the last few months. So our display cabinet is positively groaning under the weight now, and that's testament to the outstanding work delivered over the last year by our KR team of over 500 people. But back to our focus for today and our ambition to create a community of experts from across Creston Reeves and beyond to provide support for COFAs and practice managers. Now we recognise that those of you in these roles of responsibility for your firms can sometimes find yourselves in a pretty lonely position because whilst many of you will share much in common with your colleagues, you also hold responsibility for your colleagues' compliance with financial standards and the running of your practice. And we know that there are some really big challenges facing professional practices, not least uh, recruitment and talent retention, meeting clients' digital expectations, equipping the firm with the right technology, both for now and the future thriving as a hybrid working firm, knowing how to work your data, remaining on top of compliance, and last but not least, working capital and cash flow management. Now, we don't have time to cover all these topics today, but our aim is to spend the next hour or so providing you with some bite-sized in insights into a couple of these areas that particularly focus on compliance, planning, and cash flow management. So if you do find today valuable, please leave us that feedback at the end of today's session. And please also share your thoughts on the areas you would like us to cover in future sessions. We'll be following up our panel presentations with a Q&A session. So you will have the opportunity to have your questions answered by our panel of experts. So to introduce our panel of experts, we have Max Masters. Max is the head of Creston Reeves client money team, and he's going to cover a couple of the key issues that we as reporting accountants come across on a regular basis in respect to the solicitor accounts rules. We have Emily Baldwin, one of our senior outsourcing managers. Emily, we were talking about the government plans to extend making tax digital over the next few years and what this means for your firms. Dipesh Galaya is one of our senior tax managers and he will be explaining how in keeping with the Making Tax Digital programme, the government has introduced reforms changing the timings in which many partnerships and LLPs will be taxed in the future. And we have Rachel Emerson who leads our Creston Reeves funding team and will discuss the range of funding routes open to professional practices, how best to decide what is right for your firm and the pros and cons of those funding types. So if I could start with a little housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded and a recording will be sent to you all later in the day. IT permitting, we'll be asking you for a little bit of interaction by taking some polls throughout the presentations. And there will be a pop-up survey at the end of our session today. And we'd be really grateful if you could spare just a couple of minutes to provide us with some feedback. If you find today helpful, we would really welcome that feedback about putting on more sessions, creating a forum for COFAs and practice managers to come together. So on screen now, you should see instructions for how to raise a question, which we'll leave there just briefly whilst you familiarise yourself with that function. And we'll say goodbye to our panel of experts for now until the Q&A session later. And I will pass you over to Max now, who's going to highlight some of the key client money reporting areas to be aware of. Thank you, Jen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me already, uh, by way of an introduction, as Jen mentioned, I head up the firm's client money assignments. So we have about 50 of these, mostly in London and the Southeast. 
So as well as updating our work program and reviewing a number of our assignments, I also review Creston Reeves processes as we do whole client money ourselves. So I do have an idea of what it is like looking at it from the other side. Therefore, I, I know the need to be pragmatic as I appreciate that we don't live in a perfect world where we can, can comply with every single rule or piece of guidance perfectly. So I aim to spend the next 10 minutes or so discussing a couple of the key areas of the SAR rules that you should all be aware of. These updated rules have been in effect since about November 2019, so it shouldn't be new to any of you. However, there are still some issues that we do see on a regular basis that should be addressed. I'll have a quick run through these and try my best to provide some advice and some guidance. As Jen mentioned, there is a Q&A facility, so if there is anything that you're unsure about or particularly piques your interest, please do pose a question and I'll revisit this at the end. I'll also shortly be running a poll in order to gauge what you do in your firms. So the first point I wanted to talk about was in respect of systems and procedures. So should the SRA ever choose to visit your firm, it is important to be able to demonstrate that you take the security and the protection of client funds seriously. Given that these updated rules give a lot more room for interpretation, it becomes a lot more important to dedicate the appropriate time to consider your firm's particular interpretations and, and ensure that these are formalized and shared with all relevant parties. I'll go into further detail on a few of these in a sec, but just to give you a bit of flavour, these will be on things such as client payments, so covering the authorization process, including any monetary limits, uh, the payment of disbursements, free row reconciliations, so including the timescales for preparation and approval, and what to do if any differences are identified, the payment of interest, which should already be in your terms of engagement, so this one's an easy win. Uh, the transfer of office funds from mixed receipts, so uh, historically this was the 14-day rule, so um, the qu question in what your firm is doing now, and I imagine the answer for most of you is still adhering to the 14-day rule. Your processes for if breaches are identified, uh, which I'll go into a little bit of further detail on, and processes for closing files and dealing with any residual balances, um, both of which I'll talk a bit more about in due course. So it's time for the first poll of the day, um, where I just wanted to get an idea of how many of you have formal written up policies and procedures in place, which are circulated to the team and are regularly monitored. So I'll uh, just give you 20 seconds or so just to answer that, and I'll just give a brief analysis of the results once you're completed. So if you wouldn't mind popping your answer onto there. Thank you. Uh, so hopefully that's given you enough opportunity to do that. So, um, so it looks like some of you do have formal policies and procedures in place, which is good to see. Um, but kind of thankfully for me, a number of you don't, which does mean that the rest of what I'm going to talk about is relevant. So I'm pleased to see that. Um, so many of you might be thinking that if your firm's too small to warrant investing the time and in having formal policies and procedures in place, or maybe that you don't have any serious breaches and always have unqualified reports. So yeah, you don't think it's needed. This, however, is not the case. Although it is probably more important for those firms who have a history of poor compliance, it is integral for all firms to have written up systems and procedures in place. The fundamental point being, how can you check that you're complying with your own policies when nothing is written up? Having these in place greatly reduces the risk of your reporting accountant finding anything reportable during their examination. And should they do so, it is much better to be able to say to the SRA that there are these systems and procedures in place, but they're not being adhered to in this instance, rather than having to say that there are no policies in place at all. This would be much more likely to result in the SRA making further inquiries, which frankly, nobody wants. So when these are drafted, feel free to run through with your reporting accountant to ensure that they are satisfied and that, so that they can update their notes and then ensure that they are shared with all the earners, um, the accounts team and anyone else you may deem needed to um, have those. Ensure that they're reviewed and updated at least every 12 months. If applicable, they should be passed through the management board for approval, so that'd be more relevant to the larger firms amongst you. And if the resource is available, you should do internal checks periodically. So this does fall within the remit of the COFA, but this role can be delegated out to the accounts team if you'd like, as long as the results are fed back to the COFA and then detailed on the COFA register of breaches. 
which leads me seamlessly onto my next slide. So the COFRA register of breaches is a hugely important tool for any firm. If used together with a robust set of systems and procedures, it can greatly help to reduce the risk profile of the firm in respect of the SRL rules. The SRA have put a lot more onus on the COFAs over recent years to ensure the safety of security of client funds in their own firm. And yet it can be somewhat alarming to see the number of firms who have not yet implemented an effective COFA register of breaches. There are firms who either do not have a register of breaches at all, or it is pretty evident that it's only been pulled together at the year end for the benefit of the reporting accountant. However, it is a tool that should be utilised throughout the year, detailing every and any breach identified in order to identify any breaches, sorry, any patterns and to determine whether there is a need for any further training and guidance, or to see whether the systems and procedures in place are simply impractical and therefore need to be revised. It should also be used to justify the reasoning for anything a bit more unusual or ambiguous that you may come across, as we appreciate that not everything fits in nicely with the rules and guidance. This could be in respect of your interpretation of the rules and guidance for dealing with clients and accounts. Um, so these could be deputy ship accounts or court of protection, or in respect of potential banking facilities, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, uh, shortly. So I've detailed an example of a COFRA register on the slide, which I'll run through briefly. I know that some software packages do provide templates for breaches registers, but I haven't seen one yet that is as robust as we would like to see as reporting accountants. So the first few columns on the slide are pretty self-explanatory, um, but it is important that all relevant details are included, including the amounts involved and the dates the breaches were identified and subsequently corrected. It shouldn't be seen as merely a tick box exercise just to log the breach and move on for the sake of satisfying the SRA and your reporting accountant. This is where the last few columns come in handy. You should be considering whether there is a pattern of breaches. For example, is the same fee earner involved? Have there been a significant amount of similar breaches over recent months? This will then lead you to consider whether there is any further training required or potential amendments to your policies. It will also help you to determine and to justify whether the breach or pattern of breaches should be reported to the SRA. It is also useful to maintain the supporting documentation for ease of reference. Um, quite often this will be a copy of the ledger uh, involved. Uh, this is useful to refer back to and admittedly it makes your reporting accountant's uh, life a little bit easier during their examination. So there is a little bit of self-interest here. So please update your register and if needed and use it throughout the year. It is a tool that will greatly help you to satisfy the SRA that you take the safety and the security of client funds seriously. It may be a worthwhile step to add the review of the register of breaches to your month in processes as it will prompt you to consider any changes and to quiz the accounts team on any issues which may have been identified. So the final point I wanted to talk to you about to tie everything together is in respect of residual balances. Uh, you will have noted that the first example in the COFRA register was in respect of these and it is something that we still see a lot of and it remains high on the SRA's agenda as it represents a fundamental risk to client funds. Uh, I'm sure um, the majority of you know what residual balances are in respect of um, but this may be in respect of the end of a conveyancing matter where everything is completed and funds remain sitting on the client account um, and not returned for a, a period of time when they should have been. So this is something which you may deem to be reportable to the SRA if there are ongoing issues and if there's not an ongoing legal transaction that relates to these funds. It may also lead to the provision of banking facilities, which is a huge no-no for the SRA as it is illegal and could result in significant fines for both the firm and the individual fee earner. So continuing my example in respect of the end of conveyancing matter, um, you might hold the sale proceeds in respect of a client and they could tell you that they will shortly be intending to purchase a property and could you keep it on the client account. Um, first of all you should be questioning in what the ongoing legal transaction is there and therefore should you be holding the client funds? The answer is probably no. Um, but then subsequently the client might, might say oh you're holding these funds for me and um, I'm shortly going to be purchasing the car so can you make a payment to Motorline, for instance, in, in order to you know, 
cut out the middleman? And uh, the answer should always be a comprehensive no, if a client was to ask you, because that, that would be deemed to be banking facilities. And you may have seen various articles over the last few months on the Law Gazette in respect of this. So in order to reduce the risk of uh, residual balances or banking facilities, there should be systems and procedures in place for closing files. This may include having a checklist to ensure that all appropriate steps are taken when completing the file, uh, including checking the ledger and ensuring that all funds are returned. In addition to this, in case these steps are not taken, there should also be a process for reviewing any potential residual balances. So most softwares these days do have a facility to provide a report showing where there has been no movement of client balances for a certain period. We would recommend that reports detailing where there has been no movement in balances for say 12 months is reviewed and circulated to all relevant fee earners every quarter. Any balances should either be justified or returned to the client. The justification should be reviewed by the COFA to ensure that they relate to an ongoing legal transaction otherwise they could fall foul of the banking facility rules. And if there are any balances that have not been returned within the timescales in the office manual, this should be detailed on the COFA register. So hopefully this has been useful in illustrating how important it is to take these steps and how they all tie together quite neatly. Ultimately, it should make your lives easier. Uh, it may just involve investing a little bit of time now. So thank you for listening and we will now head back to Jen. Thank you very much, Max. Um, so our next session is going to be uh, presented by Emily, who's going to be talking to you about the Making Tax Digital Agenda. But before I pass on to Emily, we've got another poll question for you all to participate in. Uh, so has your firm already embraced online accounting? Yes, no, or in progress. If we could just give you a moment to pop your answers in there, that'd be really helpful. Great, thank you very much. So next I will pass you over to Emily, who's going to give you an update on where the government is with their Making Tax Digital Agenda and how you can prepare for this in your practice. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Making Tax Digital, aka MTD, is not a new phrase and has been in the making for a number of years as HMRC aims to become one of the most digitally advanced tax administrators in the world. Let's take a look at the current roadmap. So the first tax MTD applied to was VAT. And this month sees the final phase of this with MTD being applicable to all VAT registered businesses, regardless of size. Yes, that does include nil returns as well. The next tax that will fall under MTD is income tax self-assessment, which as with VAT will come in several phases. The third tax to fall into MTD will be corporation tax, but that's not expected until at least 2026. And given how the other um, taxes have been delayed, I wouldn't be surprised if corporation tax would be. Government have just said that it won't be any earlier than 2026. For the purposes of this webinar, I'll provide a recap of MTD for VAT and do a deeper dive into MTD for IPSA. So moving on, let's first have a recap of MTD for VAT. Since 2019, this has been in place for VAT registered businesses with taxable turnover above 85,000. For those that are under this threshold, this will now start to impact you as returns starting on or after the 1st of April 2022 will now need to sign up for and comply with MTD for VAT. This includes nil returns, as I said earlier. Many people simply assume that MTD for VAT is just about electronically submitting their VAT returns, and because they use online accounting software, such as Xero, that they are compliant. However, MTD for VAT has three particular requirements. The first one is maintaining digital records, the second is having digital links in place, and the third is submitting digitally to HMRC. While firefighting through the recent pandemic, many may have missed the requirement two being the end of the soft landing period in April 2021, which saw the introduction of mandatory digital links between your accounting data. So next, let's take a closer look at digital links. So a digital link is an electronic exchange of data between software programs, 
products or applications without manual intervention. Ultimately, there should be a clear digital journey from source document, such as a purchase invoice, all the way through to VAT submission. Where digital links are mandatory, there can be no manual keying in of data and cut, copy or paste, although, or cut, copy and paste, although it does allow linked cells within a spreadsheet. So Excels are still class of digital data um, and formulating those links between a tab in an Excel document is classed as a digital link. On the slide, what I've done is I've given you some examples of the accepted digital links. Um, that list is not exhaustive, but it gives you a good comprehensive idea. So when are they mandatory? The VAT notice 700 slash 22 has some clear examples of where digital links are required. One main link to consider is connection between your sales system and your accounting system if separate systems are used. Moving on, let's look at some practical call to action points for MTD for VAT. So consider online accounting software. While Excel in the eyes of HMRC is classed as digital record keeping, it is not the most efficient way to maintain accounting records and limits interrogation. This also goes for quite a lot of the desktop versions of software. By switching to an online accounting solution, it makes digital links easier and opens the door for automation and enhanced reporting. Even if you've signed up for MTD for VAT, review your processes and ensure you meet the digital links requirements. As I say, take a look at the VAT notice 700 slash 22, as this does give some clear examples from HMRC as to where they are required. Let's move on to next tax to fall into MTD. This is income tax self-assessment, also known as MTD for ITSA. So I've set out here the various different stages. So at the moment we have a date for sole trader turnover greater than 10,000 rental income and combined self-employed and rental income, that's April, 2024. Now, unless you're a sole practitioner that meets the turnover level, then your business will not fall into MTD at this stage because I'm assuming that majority of you are in a, in a partnership form. Individuals of partnerships, however, will, if they have other income outside of the practice for sole trade and rental income. Then in April 2025, it's general partnerships. So those that are not incorporated. And to be confirmed, our LLPs are more complex partnerships, such as those with corporate partners. And exempt trusts, estates, trustees of registered pension schemes and non-resident companies. So let's take a look at the process next. HMRC are yet to release full detail on MTD for ITSA, but they've shared some initial legislation and we're expecting more detail in the coming months this year. The first is maintaining digital records, as with MTD for VAT. This is where an online accounting solution will be a lot easier than either Excel spreadsheets or a desktop solution. For each business, you will need to send quarterly income and expenditure updates. This is just summary data, but a submission is required for each business, not just for the individual as a whole. The quarters will be in line with the tax year, not your accounting year. And this falls in line with the sort of changing basis period reform that HMRC are looking at, and Depeche will go into in detail. So where they'll be in line with the tax year, that means that your month, your quarter ends will be the 5th. So therefore, the 5th of July being the first quarter end. You can make an election to make it month end, so you can do 30th of June as an example, rather than the 5th of July. Again, for each business, you will need to finalise and send an end of period statement. This will finalise the P&L and include any tax and accounting adjustments. And finally, you'll be required to submit a final declaration, which will replace the current self-assessment tax return and declare all income sources for an individual and calculate the tax position. So let's look at some call to action for MTD for ITSA. So first up, consider online accounting. There are many benefits, timely information, ease of interrogation with tax software for MTD compliance. Sorry, integration, not interrogation. <laughs> As I said with MTD for VAT, ensure you have a personal tax account with HMRC 
as well as a business tax account. So by having a personal tax account yourself um, and for the partnership or company, you have greater insight to your tax affairs than we would as an agent logging into our agent gateway. There is an opportunity to join the pilot early. Although there are some restrictions on who would be eligible to join at this stage, but it's worth considering if you would like to join the pilot, it will give you a great opportunity to test your systems and understand how it would work for you as a business. There is potential for submissions to be done as a mix of in-house and your tax advisors, e.g. you could do the quarterly submissions with your tax advisors doing the end of period statement and then the final declaration. So it is important to speak to your advisor to get advice on how this will impact you and what the options are available to you. Thank you very much, Emily. So it's really important that you talk to your fellow partners or LOP members about how they're going to approach MTD for it so when the time comes along for them. Um, so another big change that's coming along for uh, members in an LLP or partners in a partnership is the change in basis periods. So I'm going to pass you over to Depeche who's going to talk us through one of the biggest changes in decades to the self-assessment tax system. Over to you Depeche. Thank you very much, Jen, and a very, very good morning from the lovely, sunny Surrey countryside. We had a bit of sleet and snow early last week and looking forward to bask in the sunshine over the Easter weekend. And that is how tax works. Change. More change. Oh, dear. But it's good to embrace this change. What is this change? Well, it will affect how profits are taxed for unincorporated businesses. The legislative background behind this is as follows. These proposals were initially laid out by the government on the 23rd of March, 2021, through the Tax Administration and Framework Review. And then came Legislation Day, otherwise known as L Day, on the 20th of July last year, with the government publishing the draft finance bill. 2021-22. As always, the government had to do a consultation on these proposals, which then closed on the 31st of August 2021, and the rules are now embedded in the Finance Act 2022, which received royal assent on the 24th of February 2022. So, ladies and gentlemen, these rules are now here with us to stay. The new rules take effect from 6th of April 2024, that is the tax year 2024-25, with the tax year 2023-24 being the transitional year. Now, in the initial rules, they were supposed to take effect from 6th of April 2023, i.e. the tax year 2023-24. However, we've now got a year of deferral, which is great as we can all plan ahead. Death, taxes and childbirth. There's never any convenient time for any of them. So why bring about these changes? The aim of the reform to basis periods rules is to make the basic assessment for trading profits a lot simpler. Simpler, we shall see, and more aligned with other sources of income, which then link in with the government's plans for MTD. Now, if you note your other sources of income, example, bank interest, dividends, employment income, they're all taxed based on the tax year. It therefore makes sense to also have profits for self-employment self to also be taxed in a similar manner, i.e. per the tax year. As my colleague Emily Baldwin has just alluded, making tax digital, MTD, becomes mandatory for self-employed businesses from April 2024. 
MTD will also apply to unincorporated businesses and landlords with annual income exceeding £10,000. And it is intended that MTD rules will also apply to partnerships that only have individuals as partners and trusts with business or property income. Now, these proposals are to enable a tax system from the ancient 19th century to be shoehorned into the digital requirements of the 21st century. Albert Einstein said, the hardest thing in the world is to understand the income tax. Before we jump off onto the rules and changes in the rules, it's important to understand what the current rules are. Now, for all unincorporated businesses, such as sole traders, partnerships, and LLPs, the basis period for a tax year is the 12 months ending with the accounting date in that tax year. For example, a partnership's trading profits for the year ended 30th of April 2021 will get assessed in the tax year 2021-22, as its accounting date, that is 30th April 2021, falls in the tax year 21-22, in between 6th of April 21 and 5th of April 22. And the authority for this is in Chapter 15, Part 2 of the Income Tax Trading and Other Income Act 2005. Therefore, from a practical perspective, a partner will not pay tax on his profits accrued to 30th April 2021 until, say, 31st of January 2023. So you can see a real mismatch in the time frame when the profits are earned or accrued and when they are taxed. Also, you have between 30th of April 2021 and 5th of April 2022 to prepare the accounts, get them finalized and signed off, consider tax planning strategies during the tax year, for example, pension planning, investments in venture capital trusts or enterprise investment schemes, etc., etc., to mitigate some of the income tax liabilities. There are special rules for the opening and closing years of a business and when there's a change in the accounting period end. The current rules in the early years of a business or when a partner gets appointed to a partnership can create overlapping basis periods, which results in profits being taxed twice, which then creates overlap relief, which is usually given on cessation of the business or when a partner retires. So, as you will see, what's the main change from the 6th of April 2024? The key reforms involve moving from the current year basis to a tax year basis, meaning that business profits will be calculated for the tax year rather than for the period of account, i.e. their accounting year end. These changes apply to all sole traders, partnerships and LLPs. This would align the treatment of trading income with other non-trading income. Now, the tax year basis periods will require businesses to report for the period from the 6th of April to the 5th of April tax year for trading purposes, regardless of their actual period of account. Businesses with non-tax year periods of account will be required to apportion profits and losses across the periods of account to adjust their results to the tax year basis. Now, this sounds complicated in the way it is, but I'll run through some examples as we go along to understand it better. For any periods where the accounts are not yet finalised, the apportionment will require a degree of estimation and subsequent finalisation. Trading and property businesses can treat an accounting date of between 31st March and 4th of April inclusive as being equivalent 
to ending at the end of the tax year, that is 5th of April. And so those businesses would not have to make the small apportionments of profits. Let's look at an example. Now, look at a, a business who makes up their accounts to 30th of April. Currently, the profits for the year ended 30th of April 2021 will get assessed in the tax year 2021-22. With a change taking effect from the tax year 2024-25, it will need to include the results to determine the taxable profits for the tax year 24-25 as follows. One month and that is one twelfth of the results for the year ended 30th April 2024. And then 11 months, that is 11 twelfths of the re results for the year ended 30th April 2025. Now, noting that the 2024-25 tax return will need to be submitted to HMRC by no later than 31st January 2026, the accounts for the year ended 2020, 30th April 2025 will need to be finalised by then. Otherwise, the 2024-25 tax return will contain estimated figures, which will require amendment once the accounts for the year ended 30th April 2025 are finalised. If we just go back to the slide before, please. Now, if you look at that main change, now, looking at that year ended 30th April 2021, the profit started to accrue from the 1st of May 2020. However, that profit does not get taxed until 31st of January 2023. Now, you can see the time lag there, and that is the time lag that the government wishes to eliminate. If we move on to example two now, please. Let's look at a business who makes up their accounts to the 30th of June. So, under current rules, the profits for the year ended 30th of June 2021 will get assessed in the tax year 2021-22. However, with a change taking effect from the tax year 2024-25, it will need to include the following results to determine the taxable profits for the tax year 2024-25. Firstly, three months, i.e. three twelfths of the results for the year ended 30th of June 2024. That's April, May and June 2024. And then nine months, i.e. nine twelfths of the results for the year ended 30th June 2025. Noting that the 2024-25 tax return will need to be submitted to HMRC by no later than 31st of January 2026. The accounts for the year ended 30th June 2025 will need to be finalised by then. Otherwise, your 24-25 tax return will contain estimated figures, which will require amendment once the accounts for the year ended 30th June 2025 are finalised. Now I will go and demonstrate how the problem actually gets worse for businesses which use accounting dates from 30th of September to 30th of March. Today it takes more brains and effort to make out the income tax form than it does to make the income. So let's look at a business who makes up their accounts to 30, 31st of December. Under current rules, the profits for the year ended 31st December 2021 will get taxed or assessed in the tax year 2021-22. However, with a change looming ahead of us, for the tax year 2024-25, that business will need to include the following results to determine the taxable profit for the tax year 24-25. So nine months, that is nine twelfths of the results for the year ended 
31st of December 2024 and three months that is three twelfths of the results for the year ended 31st of December 2025. Now, noting that the 24-25 tax return will need to be submitted to HMRC by 31st of January 2026, the accounts for the year ended 31st of December 2025 will need to be finalised by then. That only gives you one month after that year end, which makes it very difficult and perhaps impossible. Therefore, the 24-25 tax return will contain estimated figures, which will require amendment once the accounts for the year ended 31st of December 2025 are finalised. Now, this poses a real challenge to many, many businesses. If we look at the next example, and which will illustrate a classic issue with estimation. So let's fast forward ourselves to September 2025. And a sole trader or a partner partnership has just signed off their accounts up to 31st of December 2024, which shows a taxable profit of £110,000. But we now have four months to 31st of January 2026, i.e. the deadline to submit the sole trader or the partnership's 24-25 tax return. And let's assume the business did not have a good start to 2025 and that its management accounts showed a taxable profit of £15,000 for the first three months, that is January, February and March 2025. So the 24-25 tax return will show the following results. Nine months, i.e. nine twelfths of the results for the year ended 31st of December 2024, that is nine twelfths of £110,000 and that gives you £82,500. And then we take three months, i.e. three months for the results for the year ended 31st of December 2025, estimating this from the management accounts at £15,000. Therefore that business submit their tax return for 24-25 tax year by 31st of January 2026 based on a total taxable but provisional profit of £97,500. Now, once the accounts for the year ended 31st of December 2025 have been finalised, it transpires that that business was rather innovative through the year and established other avenues of revenue generation, which boosted their profitability. The final accounts for the year ended 2025, which are then signed off in September 2026, show a taxable profit of £170,000. So we now need to go and revisit the tax return for 2024-25. And this is what happens. The initial tax return obviously showed a taxable profit of £97,500. But now you will have a, a revised taxable profit of £125,000. That is £82,500 for the nine months for the year ended 31st of December 2024 and three twelfths of £170,000. The result of this as you will see, is a loss of their personal allowance, a marked increase in their income tax charge, and then interest on underpaid tax. Problems with estimation. There are additional administrative issues caused by estimation, such as you submit a tax return on an estimated basis, and then follow up with amendments when the figures are finalised. Two lots of tax returns. Possibly drastic differences in tax outcomes. Interest charges on underpaid tax. John Maynard Keynes said, the avoidance of taxes is the only intellectual pursuit 
that actually carries any reward. HMRC have suggested some options as administrative easements to minimize the burden caused by having to submit tax returns that contain provisional figures. And it will consult with stakeholders ahead of the transitional year in respect of the following options. Allow taxpayers to amend a provisional figure at the same time as they file their return for the following year. Allow an extension of the filing deadline for some groups of taxpayers, such as more complex partnerships or seasonal trades. Allowing taxpayers to include in the next year's tax return any differences between provisional and actual figures in the previous year. Or leaving the current rules on provisional figures unchanged, whereby the profits can be estimated in a return and amended as soon as the final figures become available. The next major change, phasing out of overlap profits. As I mentioned earlier, commencement, cessation, and changes of accounting dates will no longer require the complex opening year and cessation rules, as the relevant periods will simply run to and from the end of the tax years respectively. So this will eliminate all overlap profits and the need for overlap relief in the years after these changes come in. And so therefore, no further overlap profit will be allowed to be created or therefore no overlap relief will be allowed to be created or used for that matter. However, the proposed transitional arrangements do provide for the use of the existing overlap relief. So you've got to use up and exhaust the overlap relief in the transitional year 2023-24 or else they get wasted. Now, we've got this tax year 2023-24, which is known as the transitional year. In that year, continuing businesses will be taxable on following profits. Their profits on the current year basis, i.e. for the 12 months to their accounting date, which falls in the tax year 23-24, plus profits which arise in the period from the day after the current year basis period to 5th of April 2024. And depending on the accounting date of the business, as you will see shortly, this could potentially bring almost up to two years of profits into charge for this year. We look at an example to demonstrate this. A business with accounts made up to 30th of April. Currently, the profits for the year ended 30th of April 2021 will get assessed in the tax year 2021-22. However, it will need to include the following results to determine the taxable profit for the transitional year 2023-24. Results for the year ended 30th of April 2023, and that's a full 12 months, plus results from 1st of May 2023 to 31st of March 2024. Therefore, 11 months or 11 twelfths of the results for the year ended 30th April 2024. As you see here, 23 months of profit being taxed in the transitional year 2023-24. Therefore, businesses with 30th April year ends could be particularly impacted by this change. It can lead to a significantly increased tax bill. And in the transitional year, as I explained earlier, all overlap relief brought forward must be used. And in subsequent years, no further overlap relief can be created. The transition profits after the offset of overlap relief can be spread over a period of five tax years to mitigate the cash flow impacts. 
individuals can elect to be taxed on the full amount in the year of transition. An election can also be made for the additional profit allocation to kick in at any point during the spreading period of five years. And this must be done within 12 months of the self-assessment filing date for the tax year in which the taxpayer wishes to recognize the additional profits. The transition profits will be treated as a separate one-off item of taxable income, which is excluded from the net income at step two, with the equivalent tax on that income being brought into charge at step seven of the income tax calculation. A lot of jargon, but what does this mean? The transitional profit will create a standalone tax charge. And in so doing, it will not affect the level of taxpayer's income that is used to calculate things like the entitlement to relief on pension contributions and child benefit. It will also be possible to claim double tax relief where relevant. For example, credit can be claimed for overseas taxes suffered on foreign profits arising in the transitional period. An individual will also be able to claim income tax relief for relevant investments, example, enterprise investment schemes, seed enterprise investment schemes, venture capital trust investments, against the standalone tax amount, as well as their other income in that year. Now, as per the draft legislation, the initial rules penalized a business if it changed its accounting date in the transitional year. It could then not spread any transitional profits arising in that year. However, this has now been resolved in the Finance Act and businesses will be allowed to change their accounting date in the transitional year and be able to spread the transitional profits over the five years. And as you will see, a number of businesses will be considering a possible change in the accounting year end date. If a loss arises in the transitional year, then the taxpayer will be able to treat the business as seizing on the 5th of April 2024 for the purposes of terminal loss relief rules. This means that this loss can be carried back for up to three years rather than just the standard 12 months to have set against profits taxed in those years. What are the practical impacts or consequences of these changes? Well, in the short term, while the rules may simplify certain technical and practical terms, matters, firms that do not make their accounts to 31st of March or 5th of April will need to consider the impact of the proposed changes on their cash flow, particularly for the transitional year 2023-24, which could see partners paying tax on significantly increased amount of profit. The impacts will continue to be felt going forward as those changes close the timing gap between the profits accruing and being brought into charge for tax. These changes may be particularly challenging for large professional services firms with complex financial and tax affairs, and their impacts will need to be carefully considered and prepared for ahead of the transitional year. The one-year deferral is welcome, but businesses would be well advised to make sure they make best use of the extra time available. In the long term, the reforms may move or remove some of the cash flow advantages by through off operating through a partnership model and make it harder for partnerships to finance their working capital. It is possible that some firms will want to consider the pros and cons of moving to a corporate structure in due course. The ongoing requirement to apportion and or estimate profits of consecutive accounting periods may lead many businesses to consider changing their accounting date to align 
with the tax year, for example, 31st of March or 5th of April. What if the business or the partnership does not have sufficient profits in the transitional year to utilize the previously created overlap relief? That overlap relief then goes wasted. Some international partnerships may have a preference for a 31st December accounting date due to tax rules in other countries, example, the United States. On that note, the Office of Tax Simplification is currently evaluating the pros and cons of changing the UK's tax year end to either 31st of March or 31st of December. The latter, 31st of December, being considered the more radical option, but acknowledging that there may be benefits in aligning the UK with the majority of the international tax regimes. Winston Churchill said, we contend that for a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself up by the handle. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I now rest my case. Thank you very much, Depesh. That was a really comprehensive run through of the tax changes we're expecting to see. Um, so some of you, I imagine, may now be thinking about funding for these accelerated tax bills, as well as funding growth in your practices. Uh, so next, I'm going to pass you over to Rachel, who can help explain the pros and cons of various funding options. Thank you very much, Jen, and uh, thank you, Depeche. Wow, what a subject. My brain is definitely frazzled now, um, but I do love a good quote, so um, well done on that. And good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Emerson, and I head up the Creston Reeves funding team which was established back in 2020 to ensure that we are guiding our clients to a brighter future in line with our purpose as a firm. What this means in practice is that my funding team proactively review our clients' current funding structures and are able to map out the suitability of that funding against the client's future needs and aspirations. We then make recommendations which we can help the client to then explore. In the next 10 minutes or so, I plan to take you through the funding options available to you as legal firms and highlight how and why certain funding is best for different scenarios. I will also highlight the government-backed recovery loan scheme and the opportunities that presents, but more of that later. As the business grows, then the demand on cash for funding any working capital becomes increasingly challenging. As Depeche has said, in 23-24, we could potentially see five years of accelerated tax payments fall in due. How are these going to be funded? Within professional practices, tax is often dealt with in one of two ways. Some pay partners' drawings net of tax and keep hold of that tax and use this as a form of working capital throughout the year until January and July when those tax payments fall due and then the business allows it to, to build back up again. Other practices pay gross, which uh, can leave a, quite a large working capital gap within a practice, especially if switching over. So how can this gap be filled? Is that by funding or increased buy-in from partners? Ideally, the best way to finance this gap would be to actually reduce the working capital need. And that is all about financial hygiene. So reducing lockup days, increasing recovery rates, increasing utilisation of staff, et cetera, et cetera. We all know this and we all know it's the ideal, but it takes time. So let's look at some funding options available to you now. Overdrafts, you will no doubt be familiar with this option. It's a comfort blanket. That means the firm can manage cash flow within the overdraft limit set. Overdrafts, although comparably more expensive than other options can be extremely flexible and easy to understand. 
The downside is that banks or lenders can reduce or withdraw overdrafts at any time. This has been the case in the past during times of economic stress and is something that you need to consider right now. Do you have a contingency plan in place if your overdraft is removed or reduced? Often the banks and lenders will want some form of security for an overdraft. Now this could be bricks and mortar or it could be personal guarantees. With the new proposed basis period reform, is that going to place a strain on the overdraft facility that you already have? Will it therefore reduce the benefit that it currently has for you and will there be a gap created? It's also worth remembering that the recent base rate rises will have raised the cost for this type of facility and with further rises anticipated then this cost will rise further. So another option is a fixed term loan. Again, a familiar topic I'm sure. Loans are easy to understand. You borrow amount of money, the lender puts a bit of interest on it and you repay a certain amount every single month until your term is up. You can get short or long term loans and they're usually used for specific purposes such as purchasing partner equity or a premises purchase. Remember, a benefit with a loan is that you can always ask for a capital repayment holiday. And that is a benefit when times can get a little bit sticky when it comes to cash. Security again is often required for loans and this will be by way of a, a personal guarantee or bricks and mortar again. Loans can be on a variable or fixed rate. And with the rising interest rates again, is this now the right time to fix your borrowing costs to give the firm certainty on future payments? So what else do we have? We have invoice discounting. Now, historically, this has had quite a bad reputation as a form of funding. However, it is now becoming more and more popular in a post-pandemic world. It enables the firm to borrow against outstanding invoices, so where the client has not yet paid you, with a percentage of that invoice being advanced up front, so you get the cash in your bank account up front. In the world today, you are finding that clients are taking a lot longer to pay, even if it's just by a few days, that can really have an impact on your working capital gap. The percentage advanced in invoice discounting will depend um, on the lender and also on the perceived risk, but the facility can grow in, li in line with the firm's growth, which is the, the ultimate benefit for this product. It also has a fixed term, usually a year, or it's usually reviewed after a year, and that can give you confidence that it's not just going to be withdrawn as would an overdraft. It is a specialist lending product. So for law firms, it's important that you work with an established lender who understands your industry. The work involved from your in-house bookkeeping team can be quite labor intensive with reconciliations that are due to the lender on a monthly basis. However, many lenders in this market are streamlining this process and automating the process. So watch this space, it could become a lot easier. This form of financing would also apply if the firm is seeking a short term VAT loan or a longer term litigation financing, which is highly specialised. The likes of Investec and White Oak can offer quarterly rolling facilities for these types of funds, um, but they can be expensive from an APR perspective. So finally, we have asset finance. This is borrowing against the asset being purchased and is either via a higher purchase or a leasing agreement. You would typically see vehicles being financed this way, but don't forget that things like air conditioning units, desks, computer systems, they're all suitable for asset finance. You may also be familiar with financing professional indemnity premiums via this option too. 
just one thing to watch out for with regards to asset finance if you are purchasing a new asset don't just go with the higher purchase agreement or lender that whoever you're buying from gives you it's worth shopping around it's worth looking to see what other asset financiers are willing to offer so are there other options yes of course there are we have the option of equity investors so on occasion your firm may be able to attract investment directly but this would mean the investor takes a stake in the firm and shares in its ups and downs of course but the biggest downside is this loss of control it is unusual in the professional practice sector, although a very viable way to implement a buy and build strategy when looking to acquire other firms. There are also grants available that may be of interest. It is always worth looking into sources of grants or loans from your local authority, which would be linked to things like employing local people or apprenticeship schemes. And finally, we should not ignore the idea of partners within the firm investing further personal funds into the practice. This does show personal commitment to aid growth and will bode well in future discussions with lenders. As I mentioned previously, I wanted to talk a little bit today about the government backed recovery loan scheme. But first of all, I'd like to ask you a poll question. Has your firm accessed any of the government lending support schemes during the pandemic? So thank you uh, for that. So as we wait for the results, which I'll read out later, um, I wanted to mention some points regarding the recovery loan scheme. So it is a government backed loan scheme which expires at the end of June this year. Your firm can borrow these funds to support working capital, investment and growth. The scheme has been around for a year now and was initially going to end in December 2021. However, it was extended to June 2022, but with some changes. The scheme is now only open to small and medium sized enterprises. The maximum amount of finance available will be two million pounds per business. And the guarantee coverage that the government will provide to lenders has been reduced from 80% to 70%, which has seen some lenders withdraw from the scheme. The scheme covers term loans, overdrafts, invoice and asset finance, and it is, it is provided by a panel of lenders accredited by the British Business Bank. And there are some key players in there that you would have heard of. The scheme offers extremely favourable terms and interest rates are capped at 14.99%. To put this into perspective, pre-pandemic, unsecured lending saw interest rates of 20 to 25%. So the government provides a guarantee to the lender and therefore there is no personal guarantee provided to the lender by the principles of the firm. But this is only on an amount up to £250,000. However, this is quite a significant amount of money. The personal guarantee threshold is per lender. So we as a firm have seen businesses take out multiple recovery loan schemes across multiple lenders, meaning that they have borrowed more than £250,000 without any personal guarantees. Is this an opportunity that you and your firm does need to explore before the expiry at the end of June? What we are seeing as a firm is that as the end of the scheme draws closer, many business owners are wanting to explore the opportunity, either refinancing funding already in place for better rates or to remove personal guarantees currently in place or to use the scheme to plan for the next 12 to 24 months. I hope you found my funding overview useful. I personally recommend that each business reviews its financing on at least an annual basis. 
And consideration about preparing your business for funding, even if you don't think you need it just yet, shows fantastic business management. This includes things like looking after your business credit score and actually knowing what that is. When the time comes, any borrowing proposal needs to be properly researched to ensure the right option is chosen for you and your business, and not just for now, but also for the long term. The actual borrowing requirement needs to be backed up by comprehensive forecasts and analysis, which the team here at Creston Reeves can help you with. In a post-pandemic world, we must change our mindset on borrowing. It is a very cheap way to fund growth and it should not be seen as bad if being used in the right way. Remember the well-known statement, if it appreciates in value, then buy it. If it depreciates in value, then finance it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. So we have had some questions in whilst our panellists have been speaking. So please do continue to submit them if you have any that you haven't yet populated. Uh, if we're not able to answer all the questions today, then one of our experts will follow up with you after the webinar to cover your query. Um, so to the questions, Rachel, the first one that's come in is for you. It's from Mark and it says, if we no longer have access to a dedicated bank manager, how can we go about applying for the recovery loan scheme? Yes, unfortunately, this is uh, very common now in uh, the smaller end of the SME market. Um, the, the main banks are definitely taking away that access to bank managers and you're often getting a call centre. So you're, you're, you're sort of getting somebody else every time you phone up. Um, so the main thing to remember is that it is not just your bank that offers a recovery loan scheme. There are many, many alternative lenders out there. Um, now you can access these by Googling, but this can be quite time intensive. So my advice would be to talk to your accountant. They can definitely get you in touch um, with brokers. Um, and certainly here at Creston Reeves, we, we do actually work with a partnership platform where we can have a look at various options for recovery loan scheme with you and be that dedicated advisor with you. So the arm around the shoulder as such. So there are options. Um, if you can't get hold of a bank manager, then it's finding a broker broker um, or talking to your accountant with the secure option um, because it, if you've not been in that world it can be quite daunting. Thanks. Thank you Rachel. Um, Depeche we've also got a query coming on basis periods. Um, so John has asked if I have a big jump in my taxable profit in the year the changes come in so that must be the transitional year how will this affect my future payments on account? So the payments that are due January and July the following year. Yeah, so, so thank you, um, John, for that question. And that's a very, very important one uh, from a cash flow perspective. Now, as you know, that when you submit the, you, you've probably recently submitted your 2020-21 tax returns. And in there, in the computations, you will have seen uh, the payments on account for the following tax year, 21-22 which are based roughly as half of the prior year profits. Now, in the tax year 2023-24, so you have a massive jump in those profits being the transitional year. They will affect your payments and account for the subsequent tax year 24-25. And so you will, or your tax advisor, will proactively need to apply to HMRC to reduce those payments and accounts. So it's not just something that's automatic, but something that does need to be thought through quite carefully. Thank you, Depesh. Um, Rachel, I've got, got another one for you, another funding question. Um, so obviously this is linked to the fact that we have got these basis period changes coming in, and I guess uh, partners and LLP members will need to fund their tax bills, and there could be some acceleration to that. Are there options um, available to partners and LLP members for how to fund their personal tax bills? 
Yes, there are. I mean, of course, a uh, personal tax bill is a personal tax bill. So it is not down to the partnership to pay the tax. But I understand, um, as I mentioned in, uh, when I was talking, that sometimes uh, the partnership does uh, pay the tax bills. So what options are available? So uh, for the extra tax that you've got to pay, potentially an overdraft, but is that going to then... Um, reduce the benefit of that overdraft, re reduce the flexibility going forward. You have loans. So yes, the partnership can take out a loan or individuals can take out a loan. Um, and the security on that will be dependable on, basically it could be on partnership. Um, so but wh when I say that, it could be on pro partnership profit and the accounts. So if it's deemed as a business development loan, um, but also there would likely be personal guarantees in place needed. So I think something to consider at the moment is you may not need a recovery loan scheme right now, but is, is it worthwhile exploring that option to actually get a, a war chest of cash ready for that 23 slash 24 tax year um, at cheap rates with no personal guarantees. Certainly something to think about. Thank you, Rachel. And, and I, I don't know um, if, if we've heard anything, but what's the uh, revenues appetite to um, allow some deferral in the payment of those uh, accelerated tax bills? Um, often we see people deferring their payments at the moment and getting a payment plan with the revenue. Do we think that's going to be an option? Yes, I do think that that will be an option and it will be at relatively low interest rates from the revenue. However, they do work off of the Bank of England base rate. Um, we do need to think about where that's going in the next 24 months um, and it's upwards. So it's worthwhile bearing that in mind as well. But certainly on an individual basis, yes, you can set up payment plans with the revenue for any tax payments that you have personally that you can't necessarily pay all at the 31st of January. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we've got a making tax digital question next, Emily. I'll direct that to you. Um, this is, person says, it seems like MTD has a lot of benefits for HMRC, but very little for business. So what's what's in it for us? Yeah, certainly, we hear that question quite a lot. Um, basically, by submitting quarterly updates to HMRC, you'll have clearer line of sight on your tax liability is likely to be. Now, of course, due to MTD not encompassing all tax streams at the same time, this won't be 100% accurate, but it will give you an indication to enable you to sort of prepare for it. And sort of like with Rachel as well, what she's talking about with funding, you can prepare in advance if you are gonna need some funding in order to cover that, then at least you'll know a little bit in advance. Um, also, digital record keeping and embracing online accounting technology has many well-known benefits, such as saving time through process automation, flexible access to your finances. These are of course fantastic benefits, but it does get more exciting than this. So cloud systems go beyond your financial reporting and processes. By having systems integrated and talking to one another, you can see improvements in cash flow, process efficiency, staff retention, customer satisfaction. Historically, it would take days, if not weeks, to prepare and then analyze the data required to make internal business decisions. In fact, many, many business owners actually used to just go on gut feel alone and not actually have any solid data behind them because it just wasn't available quickly enough. There are now so many powerful platforms available in the market that interlink with not only your accounting records, but other systems, such as your point of sales, um, for valuable non-financial information. This allows a deeper level of insight into your finances at almost a click of a button. More informed decisions can be made at such speed to ensure you keep your business competitive. So there's sort of there's a wealth of benefits from embracing online, which comes as part of making tax digital. Um, Jen, can I just jump in there, actually? And I know you mentioned me, Emily, in, in funding. Um, it makes uh, looking for funding so, so much easier. Um, 
I think historically it's been quite time intensive to apply for any type of funding. When you can link up digital software with the lender, they can do all the research and a lot of things that they need to do independently of you. So it can make the, the whole process a lot simpler and easier. And certainly from us as accountants, um, when we can look at online data, we can easily forecast that into the future. And you might be saying to me, Rachel, you're doing, we're doing absolutely fine at the moment. We've got loads of cash at bank. Um, but if you continue trading as you're trading right now, um, I can easily see, well, actually in September, you, you're going to be into your overdraft again. Are you aware of that? Um, it's just so so many more insights, insightful information and conversations can come from it. So, sorry, I just wanted to chip in there. Thank sorry, you very just, much. Sorry, sorry just, just, just to add to the, um, see, the, the UK government wants to place our country, our nation, as in a digitally advanced nation. Um, a number of countries like Australia, New Zealand have had have been you know deploying concepts like MTD for a number of years, and technology is what will help facilitate this. In a few years' time, you'll be able to see pre-populated tax returns because HMRC will have received a lot of the information from third parties, be it banks, your employer, um, you know sh wherever you have your shareholdings, so dividend income, etc., and soon. MTD for sole traders, partnerships, etc. You'll actually have a pre-populated tax return pretty much all done for you. Isn't that amazing? Obviously, that presents risks because technology can't solve everything. It can't actually do what a human mind can do, i.e. the thinking and the planning. And that is where we come in. Thank you very much, Dipesh. Yeah, it'll be interesting those days when you log on and all your information's already there, won't it? Um, we just have one final question uh, for the moment, and that's on the solicitor accounts rules, Max. Um, is there much guidance in available in respect of banking facilities, as it's often unclear whether firms may be at risk? So obviously you highlighted providing bank facilities is one of the key risks and a key no-no, but what guidance can firms go to? Um, there is guidance available on the SRA website. So if you were to Google SRA guidance banking facilities, hopefully um, that will come up. But it's not really comprehensive enough as it stands. Um, so appreciate there's lots of nuances and intricacies in terms of the matters that you're going to deal with. Um, so it doesn't cover every single aspect. So there is still a lot of ambiguity out there and a lot of firms um, posing questions. Um, so in the first instance, I would recommend that if you're unsure, don't do it or talk to your reporting accountant or their SRA um, just to avoid that risk. But we do have a colleague who is part of an ICAW um, advisory board for solicitor firms, and they are forming a subcommittee to look into this because it is a key issue that I've been talking about. So they are talking with banks, with the SRA and the Law Society to try and pull together some more detailed guidance. So. Um, just need to keep your eye out for that. So watch this space. I'm sure we'll be circulating something when we when we see that come about. Certainly will. Yeah. Great. So uh, that that covers all the questions we've had in so far today, which is is quite good in terms of our timing. So that's great. Now, if anyone who's um, joined us today has any additional questions or matters that you'd like to discuss further with our team, then please just leave a brief description of these in the pop up survey at the end of the webinar and we will be in touch. So as I said, there's going to be a short questionnaire that will pop up when our session ends today, and we would be really grateful for your feedback. Um, so whether you're already a client working with us or not, if anything has come out of today that you'd like to discuss further, please don't hesitate to contact us. We would be delighted to hear from you. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, all that leaves me to say is I hope you stay safe and well, keep well, uh, and have a great remainder of your week. Thank you for joining us, everyone.